everyone. Uh, welcome back to our lecture series on the uh, political history of modern Japan. And today I'm going to talk about um, neoliberalism in Japan. Uh, and in the last talk, uh, I looked at the 1960s uh, student movements, the Zenkyoto Undo, um, Gakusei Undo, uh, and in this talk, uh, with the introduction of uh, neoliberal policies into Japan, uh, we're going to be picking up uh, right at the point, basically, that we left off in the last talk. So it's going to be about the early to mid-1970s, um, about half a decade later, that uh, I'll begin my talk today. Um, <clears throat> okay, so get started here. The title of my talk is Neoliberalism in Japan, uh, the Bubble Era and the End of Showa. <clears throat> Um, and you might be wondering, you know, why, why neoliberalism? Um, I thought we were doing a, a course on uh, political history and, you know, isn't neoliberalism, doesn't that relate to economics? Isn't that all just about economic policy? Well, yes and no. Um, neoliberalism basically, um, relies on a kind of restructuring of the state and the structure of the state and of politics. And we've already looked at the uh, connections, some of the connections between politics and uh, between pol political parties, for instance, bureaucracy and the business community. And this is kind of just going to be carrying on that um, tradition in a way where um, you know, members of the business community um, basically lobby politicians, etc., to get politicians to enact policies that are more favorable to them. But neoliberalism requires such a profound restructuring of the state and such a hollowing out of state functions and, uh, and marketization of um, state functions that it really radically uh, alters the, the shape of the state and of politics. So I think it's really important to look at this, and I hope that this will uh, go a long way to kind of understanding um, partly where we are today in Japan. Um, some of the sources and books that I'm going to be drawing from in my talk, uh, I have... Um, displayed right here. And I, I just want to introduce these from the beginning because I think um, they're really interesting. They're very important. Um, I, of course, am basically just summarizing the contents and arguments that are made in these sources and really tying them to the Japanese context, of course. Um, but anyway, you know, some of these, these are, are really great sources. And so I want to start out by introducing these. Um, the main book uh, that I'll begin with is A Brief History of Neoliberalism by David Harvey, a very well-known uh, scholar, uh, radical geographer, but he writes on uh, topics of economics and economic history. Um, his, this book right here um, is, is a great source and a great introduction to uh, understanding what neoliberalism is. Another book that I frequently draw from, um, this will probably be the last time that I use it because it only takes us up to 1994, uh, so in this series uh, I won't be able to draw from this anymore, but um, Nakamura Takafusa's uh, lectures on modern Japanese economic history, uh, I think I've maybe mentioned this before, but I frequently draw from this. Um, another book, a volume of essays, uh, edited volume of essays, Neoliberalism, a Critical Reader. This is very good. This has um, an essay especially by the Japanese uh, economic scholar uh, Ito Makoto uh, in this volume, which I'll be drawing from that uh, especially. 
and another one by uh, Richard Dayton, uh, Narratives of Equivalence, Neoliberalism in Contemporary Japan. Um, this is another very interesting article that introduces the kind of um, ideological and theoretical uh, foundations or basis, if you can call them that, for implementing neoliberalism in Japan. And then finally, an essay, and I assigned this one in my um, class, actually, that uh, I'm teaching this semester, Gavin McCormick's uh, Koizumi's Ku, it's called. So especially looking at some of the neoliberal reforms that uh, Prime Minister Koizumi Junichido uh, implemented in the early 2000s. Okay, but first I want to start out just talking about what neoliberalism is and, and kind of introducing that as a concept. And David Harvey defines it in the following way. He says it's a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. And it sounds a little complicated, but the key words, key phrases are all basically right here. Strong private property rights, free markets, free trade, and we'll get into what exactly that entails uh, in a minute. Um, Harvey goes on to say that neoliberalism has been the primary uh, hegemonic economic model since the 1980s and that it seeks to bring all human action into the domain of the market. The main role of the state, of the neoliberal state, is to create a good business climate to protect private property. And the state may deploy authoritarian force, if necessary, to enforce pro-business policies. So. There's nothing inherently democratic uh, about neoliberalism. If anything, it's the opposite. Um, <clears throat> there are additional freedoms, such as free speech, free association, but these are tangential. They're not the primary uh, aim or even um, product of neoliberalism, and it will use the language of freedom to um, kind of mask uh, what what it's trying to do, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a, as we go on. <laughs> Especially it's been supported through the hegemonic state rule of the U.S., as well as institutions such as the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. Uh, okay, <laughs> and Harvey, in his work, he especially talks about um, the history of neoliberalism, starting with its origins in the uh, Mont Pelerin Society uh, in 1947, which um, Fred Frederick von Hayek, economists like Frederick von Hayek, uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, Milton Friedman were members of this society. And they came up with this kind of alternative economic model, basically, um, uh, to, which would eventually come to kind of counter Keynesianism which was the other main economic model, and it's the one that was eventually adopted uh, immediately after World War II. But their theory wasn't totally coherent, nor was it consistent. So Harvey emphasizes the need to pay attention to the difference between theory and practice. And to cite a very uh, easy to understand example, neoliberalism um, frequently says it's against state intervention, it's against a strong state, reduce the role of the state is uh, what it basically, it's, its motto, what it repeats ad infinitum. But the state acts, it requires a strong state to protect private property in practice. So there's already this inherent um, inconsistency uh, in, in neoliberal uh, theory. But Harvey says these inconsistencies actually don't really matter because the real goal of neoliberalism is, quote, the restoration or reconstruction of the power of economic elites through forced privatization. Um, so it's not really about freedom, a free market even per se. It's not about, um, you know, just reducing state intervention. I mean, it does these things, but it does them with the aim of um, basically 
uh, redistributing wealth upward. Um, and the result has been, as we've seen uh, globally, uh, extreme increasing uh, inequalities uh, around the world. So the top 1% has taken more and more of uh, the total global wealth. And this first neoliberalism was first implemented in kind of an experimental phase in Chile under the Pinochet uh, dictatorship in the 1970s. And Pinochet came to power through a military coup uh, with the help of the US CIA. And he relied on the advice of the so-called Chicago Boys, a group of US economists, uh, economists from the University of Chicago who had been influenced by Milton Friedman and other neoliberal uh, and his neoliberal theories. So they negotiated a series of loans with the IMF, privatized public assets, opened up natural resources, focused on export-led growth. Uh, but of this project, their project did not succeed uh, per se. It did not last. They were partly successful in, you know, um, stripping away the wealth and assets. Uh, of the Chilean uh, government and people and putting them into private hands. But uh, in terms of a, a long-term political project, it didn't last there. And this was an incredibly violent um, authoritarian uh, dictatorship uh, that, that wreaked havoc in people, people's lives. But this was really just a trial run, basically, for Western states to learn from so that they could implement their own neoliberal, neoliberal program. Um, and this is exactly what happened then um, with, uh, especially in, in, under the Thatcher uh, government in the UK and under President Ronald Reagan in uh, the US. And Reagan especially attacked labor and aided capital through tax cuts, uh, cutting wages, uh, and these kinds of things. So this is where we first start to see it then kind of really uh, take hold in, uh, in the UK and uh, in the US. Um, Harvey talks about how neoliberal, uh, neo, you know, he goes on to then focus on the roles of the neoliberal state. You know, what is the relationship between the seemingly ec economic model uh, economic theory, economic policy, and uh, state and the government. And it's all about, again, protecting private property and free trade. Um, and the role of the state is to protect these things with violence if necessary. Um, and it interprets, it emphasizes individual freedom uh, and personal responsibility. Um, which means individual, the individual is responsible for their own social welfare and security. So this is, is, you know, personal responsibility in terms like this that neoliberals use. It sounds really good, but what they're really trying to do is use this as a justification to gut social services, like, you know, take away money from um, public health care, from health care, privatize health care, privatize all these social services, and then... Um, all of these people then who are left out of the system, neoliberal politicians will just say like, well, hey, that's your responsibility to take care of your own health, right? That's, that's not our responsibility. So um, it's kind of a negative personal responsibility in a way. So they take these terms that, that sound kind of good and then use them to kind of convince people that um, these policies that they're implementing are, are in average people's interests. Uh, when in fact they're not. And in Japan, this would be jiko sekinin, the idea of jiko sekinin. So um, neoliberalism is also very suspicious of democracy in general. It's not about, it's not a democratic project. It's not about giving power to the people. Instead, it favors governance, uh, not government, but governance by experts and uh, elites. Um, whose job is basically to run and to micromanage uh, society and, and uh, functions of, of government. Uh, tries to Companies under neoliberalism will try to offset and externalize their liabilities uh, and costs, for example, dumping pollutants into the surrounding environs. Um, this would be a case of where then seemingly 
this would require state intervention into the market. Like, um, you know, you can't just let companies get away with dumping pollutants into the environment. There has to be some kind of consequence for that. But um, the neoliberal state does, uh, doesn't intervene in these cases, even in these cases. Um, another inconsistency with neoliberalism would, it, would be that it says that there's no hierarchies of power, but this is a willful denial of reality. For example, uh, buying up patents would be another key example of, of where there's a need for government intervention. Um, if you buy up and monopolize patents, it prohibits uh, new inventions and new products from coming out. So this is really an anti kind of free market thing. It's more of a monopolistic type of thing. But um, this is one of those inconsistencies where the neoliberals would say, no, the government can't regulate even this. So what it does is it just concentrates, again, wealth and power into fewer and fewer hands. And Harvey says also, while individuals are supposedly free to choose, they're not supposed to choose to construct strong collective institutions such as trade unions, and they most certainly should not choose to associate to create political parties with the aim of forcing the state to intervene, uh, intervene in or eliminate the market. So again, it emphasizes so-called freedom, personal freedom, individual freedom, um, but in fact, people are not free to participate in politics the way that they want. They're not free to construct society in the way that they want. What it really means, what neoliberals really mean when they talk about freedom is uh, free market, essentially, free trade. Um, okay, and I just want to touch on another really important uh, contradiction of neoliberalism. So um, neoliberals call for the deregulation of um, capital, of finance, of all of these things. They they decry government intervention. They say, you know, less government intervention, less government, that's what we want. But every time there's um, some kind of a crisis caused through increased financialization, such as the 2008 Lehman shock, for instance, then banks, for instance, and financial institutions will rely on the state to bail them out because they made printed all these, you know, they lent, made all these bad loans um, and the only institution that can create money is the central bank. So all of these private uh, companies and uh, banks are relying essentially on the government, even while they're saying no government intervention, no government intervention. So it's, it's really kind of a, a big kind of hypocrisy here. Okay, so I want to try to bring this over to then what we've been talking about with neoliberalism. I want to try to, to, to connect this to Japan, but... I've got to kind of set the stage first, I feel like, and I want to do that by talking about the bubble era and the end of the Showa period. Um, by the way, some of the, uh, well, the prime ministers uh, that, that we're going to be talking about uh, in this period, uh, some of the names especially to remember would be Nakasone Yasuhiro, um, who was uh, prime minister at the same time as Thatcher in, in the UK, and uh, Reagan in the U.S. and you know they were all uh, kind of buddy buddy and um, working together to implement neoliberal uh, reforms in their respective uh, countries to deregulate the market, etc. Um, so he's uh, definitely an important figure uh, in this. And then another figure that we're going to be talking about, especially uh, jumping into the early 2000s, is Koizumi Junichiro, and we're going to be looking at. Uh, eventually his efforts to uh, privatize uh, the postal service in Japan. Okay, so the bubble economy, so what was this? What, what triggered uh, the, the economic bubble and its collapse? Well, the government uh, deregulated overseas financial transactions for Japanese companies in the early 80s. So this deregulation of uh, of Finance is a major part. Um, the yen was growing stronger through the 1980s, but this was actually just hurting Japanese exporters, who then tried to make up for lost profits uh, by moving their production overseas. So here we have kind of this deindustrialization happening within Japan. At the same time, domestic growth and capital investments were growing. Low interest rates uh, had spurred further lending and investments and growth, but at the same time, banks were lent, you know, making credit too easy. They were lending out loans too easily. 
So this fuels then um, stock, stock prices, soaring stock prices in the late 80s, and this overabundance of kind of, uh, you know, cheap loans, low interest loans, um, and, and capital, which then is uh, invested all over the place, especially in real estate. So uh, the price of real estate then skyrockets, um, and uh, and so, so this is a major uh, part of this this bubble uh, as well. And at the same time, then firms are also borrowing heavily from low interest overseas bonds. Since there's a strong yen, companies are able to repay their loans or bonds with less money than the amount raised, meaning they could make money from borrowing. Um, this spurred more purchasing and lending in an inflationary spiral. Um, and again, as I mentioned, much of this investment went to real estate so that eventually during the bubble period, Japan became the world's largest net asset holder. And Nakamura uh, Takafusa writes, uh, the bubble was born out of the complex interaction of financial deregulation, as I mentioned, and internationalization, and the current uh, account surplus triggered by the strengthening of the yen, as I've just explained here. In 1989 and 1990, the Bank of Japan tightened credit, stock, real estate, and asset prices fell as a result, and the bank suffered huge losses from, uh, they were left holding a lot of bad loans that couldn't be repaid, uh, and this is all a result of their uh, over-lending or too easy lending. And this would be the collapse of the bubble then. And the collapse of the bubble then overlapped with a, two other very important uh, events that were happening at this time that we need to point out. Uh, then that kind of, uh, and this would be, anyway, the, um, the death of the uh, Showa Emperor Hirohito in 1989 and the end of the Cold War in 1990. Um, so this, this is kind of the beginning, this, all of this happens at the beginning of the 1990s, essentially, and the collapse of the bubble then starts this, um, these lost decades, essentially, of decades of stagnation, of stagflation within Japan, um, a stagnant economy, uh, declining birth rates, declining wages, and all of this. But I'm going to show in a minute how all of this is very much connected to all of these neoliberal reforms, the deregulation of finance, for instance, being a major one that I've just mentioned. Um, other events that were happening at this time in the 1990s, major events um, in political and geopolitical uh, realm, would be... Uh, the Gulf War in 1990-1991. This is the first instance when Japan uh, dispatched the its self-defense forces overseas in support of U.S. troops. In 1995, this was the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, and that same year, there was the Hanshin earthquake uh, in January, and then the Aum Shinrikyo sarin gas attack in uh, March. Okay, and then another thing to mention, and I'll touch on this in another lecture at a later time, but um, there had been a growing recognition within Japan throughout the 1980s and 19, early 1990s especially um, to recognize uh, the history of Japanese wartime military aggression and Japanese war crimes uh, in Asia, and um, a growing acceptance and recognition of this among the Japanese public, and even uh, eventually um, Japanese politicians were forced to uh, recognize and acknowledge and even issue official apologies uh, for Japan's uh, military wartime aggression and uh, for its war responsibility. Um, the peak of this came then at the 50th anniversary of World War II, but all of these apologies and this growing recognition of Japan's war crimes prompted a neo-nationalist or a right-wing backlash from historical revisionists who sought to erase the history and memories of Japanese war crimes and to portray Jap um, Japanese uh, history and Japanese uh, uh, wartime history especially as being justified and rather being something um, that people should feel proud of. And all of this was done with the aim of inspiring uh, patriotism and nationalism, instilling this in the minds of contemporary youth. This overlaps, again, with neoliberal reforms that I'm going to be talking about in a minute, and I'll show exactly how that happened um, uh, later. But 
there are a number of lingering questions anyway in this context that are left remaining from unresolved from the, the 1990s that, that are still um, affecting us today. Uh, for instance, what is Japan's future role with the U.S.? What about with its East Asian neighbors, especially China and Korea? How will Japan address rising inequality? And how will it address its history problems? All of these things um, were questions that arose in the 1990s that remain unresolved today. Okay, so now getting into the main focus. I've kind of set the stage, introduced what neoliberalism is, talked about the historical background uh, a little bit from the time that these reforms were implemented, and now we'll get into uh, neoliberalism in Japan. So Prime Minister Suzuki introduced uh, in 1981, um, uh, or he formed a committee to, to help uh, focus on reducing the size and the role of the government. And um, in this process, he began to then, uh, this committee, uh, on the advice of this committee, began to reduce the number of civil servants, to privatize state enterprises, and to deregulate in the name of free market principles. Also, reforms taken by under the Suzuki cabinet made it easier for companies to, quote, rationalize wage costs with part-time workers. In Japanese, this would be gorika. Uh, what this really means, basically, is eliminating full-time uh, work, full-time employment, uh, and, and other benefits, uh, and replacing that with part-time workers with very few or to no benefits. Uh, the number of union workers from this time uh, began then, as a result of these reforms, began to drop dramatically, whereas in the 1970s, 35% of workers were unionized. Uh, in 2003, this fell to just 19.6% uh, of workers. And the biggest blow came from the privatization of three major state enterprises, Japan National Railways, uh, which is today JR, uh, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Public Corp, uh, NTT, and Japan Tobacco and Salt Public Corp, uh, all in 1985. And unions were especially weakened uh, as a result of this privatization because the number of workers was reduced from its peak of 400,000 within these three corporate companies in 1982 to just half that number by 1987. So in a period of five years, 200,000 workers from these companies as they're privatized are laid off. And at the time, which workers are, are laid off? Well, it's union members who are selectively uh, fired from those companies. And this basically then, this and also um, the, their inability to oppose these reforms spelled the end of the major national labor union, Sohyo, who we've talked about in prior lectures as uh, being influential uh, in, in leading some of the mass protests uh, against U.S. security, uh, U.S.-Japan security treaty revision, etc. Um, so there had been a split within uh, Sohyo between Sohyo and Dome. And Dome was uh, basically um, the, bran the branch of the labor union that was more friendly to private business and more willing to compromise with private business. So in 1989, Sohyo completely dissolved, it merged with Dome to form uh, Rengo, which is what it, we have today, the Confederation of All Japan Trade Unions. Um, but the, the oppositional stance that they had taken of strongly standing up for uh, labor, for labor issues against capital, uh, completely fell to the wayside, essentially, in, from this time. And the collapse of, of these three major industries, and especially Sohyo, was a huge shock to the Japan Socialist Party because that was the majority of its supporters. So the Japan Socially Party, Socialist Party is basically rendered defunct from this time. Uh, it temporarily joined with the LDP in 1994 and then changed its name to the Social Democratic Party of Japan in 1996, but it gradually lost seats throughout the 1990s until the point where we're at today, where it's basically irrelevant. Um, the major opposition party in place of that that emerged was the Democratic Party of Japan, uh, Minshuto, the DPJ. Um, they were the new opposition, but Ito Makoto, there was so much overlap between the DPJ and the LDP as there is still today, especially in regards to uh, neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism, and the fact that both of them are very beholden to the business community, to major corporations, 
as a result of this, uh, Ido Makoto uh, has stated, consequently, there has been, clearly been an increasingly conservative tendency in Japanese politics, as well as ideology, which facilitated the imposition of neoliberal policies. So getting the opposition from labor out of the way and getting other meaningful political opposition out of the way paved the road for the DPJ, the LDP, to basically work together essentially to implement neoliberal reforms on a major scale. Um, productivity throughout this time uh, has been growing then. It started to grow while real wages declined. And so we're still at this point today where productivity rises, wages decline. So this is huge victory for capital, essentially. Um, and then consumer taxes were introduced, and there's been a big uh, fuss about raising consumer taxes again just last year. Um, but they were introduced from this time to shift the fiscal costs of the state from large corporations to average citizens. So the corporate tax rate and the inheritance tax rate had been reduced to the point where the corporate tax rate today is in Japan is essentially zero. Um, and all of this burden of responsibility then, so uh, is shifted to average citizens who now have to um, uh, make up for these giant corporations not paying taxes, essentially. Um, also, the time limit of one year on part-time employment was abolished. Previously, firms would have to offer the option of full-time employment to uh, its part-time employees. It did, no longer had to do this anymore. And so Ito Makoto writes, these neoliberal labor policies enhance the freedom of capitalist firms to use cheaper work workers flexibly in a competitive labor market. Continuing on with this background, as I mentioned again, the deregulation of finance and capital was a major um, event triggering this as well and facilitating this. Uh, this happened with the uh, signing of the 1985 Plaza Accord. Interest rates were reduced, relating to an appreciation of the yen, as I mentioned. Uh, Japanese foreign direct investment escalated. And I also already talked about the real estate speculation. Um, this boomed fueling speculative uh, bubble. This was the economic bubble that I mentioned. But this collapses, collapsed in the 1990s with the, to the total lost assets uh, coming in at 1,000 trillion yen, or 2.5 times the country's GDP. Uh, banks were left holding bad loans and lost latent capital gains, again, as I mentioned, and they're still struggling to make up for this. Uh, in response, the Bank of Japan reduced the official interest rate. Uh, so in 1990, uh, their interest rate was 6%, and now in 2001, it was reduced to just 0.1%. But banks were still struggling to expand loans since the price of shares in real estate were declining. Uh, and then this, as a result, reduced the number of small and medium businesses. Banks are less willing to lend to small and medium businesses. Uh, and the number of um, bankruptcies grows among small and medium businesses. And this leads to a rising unemployment rate. Um, much of the Japanese workforce is employed uh, with small and medium businesses. So with their bankruptcies, you have rising unemployment. In 1990, unemployment rate was at 2%. In 2002, it was 5.7%. But the real figures based on, there's a, a kind of, I guess, unique way to, that these are calculated in Japan. So that real figures, actually experts consider them to be higher. Um, domestic demand slumped and pay and income declined. And Ito writes of the situation, thus the bad loans of the Japanese banks have not been cleared up and instead they have fed the deflationary spiral of the economy. So in a way, again, still the stagflation, stagnation that we're experiencing today is partly a result of this bubble collapse. I would also say of other financial collapses as well. Um, and the deregulation of finance continues um, and, and, what, and what, and you know, and stock prices, etc., cetera, will, will continue to, uh, you know, go through this series of uh, rises and, and crashes. Um, so there's, there's also this behind it as well. Um, as I already mentioned, and, and Ito points out that this, in order to reduce the fiscal deficit, the government relied basically on uh, raising consumer taxes. Uh, and in the process, they emphasized individual responsibility. So raising consumer taxes and privatizing people's uh, social security 
uh, this kind of the so, uh, or social welfare elements of social welfare, the government tries to pitch this as a good thing that is in people's best interest, when in fact, of course, it's not. And the way that they'll do this is with the language of jiko sekinin, individual responsibility. Like, hey, this is good for you. You know, it's good for you to, to take care of your own uh, health care or whatever, something like that. Um, but ironically, and maybe tragically, um, none of these things reduce the fiscal deficit. Uh, because the government main in, and it still remains an incredibly low corporate tax rate. So all of these things, even cutting social services, raising consumer taxes, it's not enough to make up for corporations not paying taxes. Um, so the value of outstanding government bonds, i.e. the deficit, uh, continues to grow. And I want to read some quotes then uh, from Ito uh, about the consequences of this uh, in Japanese society. The financial burden of raising children and obtaining education, medical services, and care for the elderly parents has not been addressed by public spending, and this burden has increased due to the deepening fiscal crisis of the state and its imposition of neoliberal social policies. Uh, one result would be a falling birth rate, of course. You know, you have declining wages. People can't, they're less motivated to start a family or to have more kids because they feel like they can't support them economically. And Ito says, the tragedy of Japan is the absence of a strong opposition party representing the interests of the workers and able to provide a critique of and an alternative to neoliberal parties. So he doesn't characterize uh, the LDP, for instance, or the JDP, for instance, uh, as any kind of meaningful opposition, since in terms of neoliberal policies, they're basically in agreement. Um, Okay, I want to talk about some of the theoretical, quote, basis, if that can be called that, for neoliberalism in Japan. Uh, and here I'll be drawing from the uh, Richard Rayton's article. Um, okay, so he traces, Rayton traces the origins of this uh, to, partly to econom the economist Nishiyama Chiaki, who translated Friedman, Hayek, and other, other neoliberal thinkers. And in fact, he himself studied under Hayek at the University of Chicago in the 1950s. Nishiyama argued that society must be, quote, nomocratic, which focused on individuality and private property, as opposed to society or community, which, was, which he called telecratic society. And he said this was a prerequisite for, quote, free economy. Um, Another influential neoliberal uh, thinker in Japan was Koyama Kenichi, who was advisor to Prime Minister Ohida and Nakasone. He organized a group of scholars called, the group, called Group 1984, taken from the title of George Orwell's novel, uh, to streamline government through privatizations and abolishment of social welfare programs. They called regulation of industry uh, witch hunts, so they were very much against any kind of government interference, except, of course, as I mentioned, for uh, the government bailing out uh, private corporations and banks uh, who gambled away their money, basically. Uh, they tried to silence the anti-pollution protesters against uh, industry and, and prevent anti-pollution uh, measures from being taken, and in the process gained the support of the business community Keidan then. Koyama also promoted social engineering product uh, projects. Uh, in his words, quote, improving the quality of human beings. And he said people with low IQs had, quote, no use, and urged the government to support eugenics. So again, we see here this extreme focus on an attack on labor and raising productivity at the expense of labor to the point that neoliberal thinkers, some of them are arguing for eugenics. Uh, neoliberal scholars use language to mask the reforms, as I already mentioned. Um, uh, the economist Murakami ya uh, Yasu, uh, Yasusuke, uh, an advisor to Prime Minister Miki Takeo uh, from 1974 to 1976, popularized the idea of Japan as a, quote, classless and, quote, conflict-free society, um, emphasizing harmony and everyone being of, of the same middle class, essentially. But the aim here with this language and rhetoric was to downplay histor the historical role of class conflict in Japan, which is something that I've been trying to highlight and emphasize uh, in these lectures. Um, and also, 
neoliberalism and what are called Nihonjin non discourses occurred in tandem. Uh, Nihonjin non, this, these emerged from the 1970s as well. They emphasized Japanese, quote, uniqueness and other racialistic characteristics of the, quote, Japanese people, uh, such as the idea of a common history, morality, and culture. Prime Minister Ohida Masayoshi supported this in 1979 when he formed the group, a group to publish uh, Bunka no Jidai, a nine-volume report which emphasized, quote, the special quality of Japan's culture. And they portrayed Japan as, quote, harmonious and, quote, homogeneous to downplay internal differences in Japan, including the presence of minorities and class conflict. And Prime Minister Nakasone even later uh, later emphasizes, too, he even refused to acknowledge that there were ethnic minorities in Japan. Uh, of course, there are the Ainu, the Ryukyu, uh, Zainichi Koreans, and many other kinds of immigrants, um, but this idea of homogeneity uh, was so strong amongst the Japanese right and neoliberals like Nakasone that they would downplay this. And how did this function in tandem with neoliberalism to facilitate the introduction of neoliberalist policies? Well, ideas of social harmony, for instance, were used in the workplace to crush worker dissent and opposition. Ideas of Japanese spirit and morality were used to motivate workers to be more productive and to work harder while not worrying about pay. For instance, the idea, which is a common stereotype, uh, even in the world today, that Japanese people are industrious or hard workers or that they just like to work overtime or something. Something like this, this is an idea of this kind of uh, racialistic thinking that emphasizes social harmony uh, in order to facilitate these neoliberal policies to crush uh, labor. Uh, also, a scholar Yamada Masahiro uh, bashed young people who opted to live at home with their parents. And in fact, um, it's common of neoliberal scholars to um, basically uh, badmouth young people in Japanese youth and to say that they're so lazy or something like that. Uh, he called uh, youth, quote, social parasites, uh, this is youth who are living at home with parents, and accused them of being unproductive. <laughs> but what he really meant was that they were refusing to produce extra surplus value, of course. He framed them in a negative critique, saying that they lacked individuality, etc. So here again, drawing in this discourse of individuality, right? Kadon then in the business community uh, and the publisher PHP, which stood for Peace and Happiness Through Prosperity, this is still a major publisher by the way, uh, put out by Panasonic, uh, also bashed youth for being quote lazy and quote unproductive. So again, placing the, um, the burden on young people to basically work harder and to say, hey, you're not being Japanese enough, you're not, you're not um, you know, respecting your tradition, our traditions of uh, hard work. And, you know, don't worry about pay because that's not the point, right? Um, this is how they kind of use this language and, and kind of racialistic thinking. Um, moreover, neoliberals argued that increased inequality was a good thing and that and it was a sign that the market was working since winners are, were rewarded and, quote, losers were punished. The group 1984 uh, criticized post-war Japanese welfare state as well for bringing too much abundance. I mean, this is, I'm sorry, this is, this is, I just, I can't believe this is unbelievable, but um, this is, this is again, you know, criticizing this welfare state that had brought abundance in people's lives um, and saying that somehow trying to, to spin this as a bad thing. And, and the, the horribly ironic thing is that they were basically successful. Uh, it said this had made people lazy and that it threatened so-called traditional Japanese morality. Instead, they emphasized, again, individual responsibility. But the results of this, as we have seen in our experiencing today, has been a widening wealth gap, increased poverty, especially among women, youth, and part-time workers. Uh, part-time workers now comprise about 40% of the total Japanese workforce. And in 2009, Japan ranked fourth highest in the poverty rate among OECD states. I want to focus on a more specific example of neoliberal reforms through the case of uh, Prime Minister Koizumi Junichido's early 2000 uh, uh, privatization of the Postal Service. Koizumi narrowly won re-election in September 2005 
And just prior to that, in August, had plans to fully privatize the Postal Service had hit a snag. He wanted to divide up the four branches, savings, delivery, etc., into four distinct enterprises by 2007 and fully privatized by 2017. Um, but there was opposition uh, in the upper house and within his own LDP, with some LDP politicians voting against their own party uh, and voting, opting not to privatize the postal service at first. Um, eventually he was successful, but at first uh, he, he had hit a snag. So Koizumi then uh, attempted to punish these members by calling a snap election and then actively trying to defeat all 37 of them who opposed his measures uh, in, during the election. Um, he had a powerful ally, uh, the United States, who had been pressuring Japan to privatize the post service, Postal Service for years. Um, the main reason was that the Postal Service in Japan is kind of a, a special uh, organization because it was also a bank, basically. It managed people's savings. And you can go to Yucho Ginko today, which is a Postal Service bank. Um, so part of this still exists. Um, but at that time, it was a, a public uh, kind of service, right? A public corporation. And people's savings account in the Japanese Postal Service were the world's largest fund, over $2 trillion in savings and $1 trillion in insurance policies. This was more assets than Citigroup, the, the major uh, financial and banking institution. So this was the largest amount of private funds um, in the world, and it was people's savings. There's very high savings rate in Japan, as you are probably aware. And Washington and neoliberals like Koizumi in the LDP and JDP wanted to privatize uh, the Postal Service so that they could um, uh, financialize this money and so that they could start to gamble with it on the stock market. Um, traditionally, these postal savings had made up a large portion of the Keynesian government uh, big projects and helped the construction state uh, high, through, you know, allowing to build highways, airports, etc. It was predicated on growth, but global growth had slowed by the late 1980s, so that now that apparatus just appeared bloated and it became, eminy, uh, became an enemy and a target for uh, proponents of privatization. Koizumi did not like the old Tanaka Kakue faction, which had benefited from Keynesian embedded liberalism in the construction state. He instead aligned with Washington to deregulate all and everything. And Gavin McCormick writes, Japan's institutions were to be adjusted to American requirements. As I mentioned, privatization of the Postal Service was huge because it meant all these private savings would be directed to the financial sector. And Gavin McCormick has uh, very nicely summarized this as the stock marketization of the Japanese people's savings. In Japan, very little of the population is either shareholders or traders, only 10 and 3 percent respectively. Uh, typically, the postal savings uh, were the main customer of government of Japan bonds. So this is this Keynesianist kind of construction state, right? Funding um, government, you know, buying government bonds to fund these big government projects. But privatization would break this so that overseas investors would be the main purchasers of uh, government bonds. They would be much less forgiving of debts, of government debts, and they would raise the interest rates too, which happened. And this means that uh, there would be slower internal growth in Japan and economic stagnation, um, which is exactly what we're experiencing again, but the financial sector would benefit. And so this was really the main aim. Again, this financialization, the stock marketization of the state, essentially. Uh, U.S. bankers and elite academics argued, however, that Japan, the Japanese government could make this up through higher taxes and reduced benefits, uh, a.k.a. austerity. Other consequences of this were that uh, public post office officials were made private officials and that loans and backup for small businesses suffered. Uh, also, importantly, there was rising inequality over 1 million households on welfare and 2 to 3 million more should be put on welfare, requiring welfare. Uh, the manufacturing sector shed jobs and um, much of full-time employment, as I mentioned, was made part-time. There was a doubling of the amount of part-time workers between 1994 and 2004. 
and McCormick writes, these workers constitute a new reserve army of short contract labor for whom employers are not required to make any health or welfare provision and earn about half the salary of regulars. Um, also, uh, the number of suicides rose from around 22,000 in 1997 to 32,000 in 2004. This is twice the rate in the U.S. Um, and again, lots of this is a result of stress from overwork and inability to support oneself financially because wages are so low. The DPJ, uh, as I mentioned, again, um, and Ito Makoto has pointed out, there is not a whole lot of difference uh, ideologically between the DPJ and the L uh, LDP. The DPJ helped Koizumi achieve this, even over members of his own party. Uh, Keidan then supported the DPJ to win 50 seats in the 2003 election. And McCormick says the, DP the DPJ's social and economic policies differed only marginally from the LDP's. The DPJ campaign was utterly conventional and offered no effective criticism of the sort of society Koizumi was bent on creating, or uh, let alone an alternative vision. Uh, instead, uh, the LDP increasingly, so it had, it gives average people, it offers average people less and less, essentially, in terms of social welfare, but what it does uh, give people is, as I'll talk about more in a minute, nationalism, essentially. Um, and Koizumi's reform, he, these were invoked in nationalistic terms. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over some of this, and yeah, some of this as well, and just continue on with that national, uh, talking about nationalism. So basically, um, as I mentioned, you know, the government is offering average people less and less, but it tries to make up for that by um, portraying... Um, what it's doing in very nationalistic terms and, and offering people nationalism, essentially. So, um, for instance, Koizumi um, would unabashedly worship at Yasukuni's shrine uh, and sought to revise the fundamental law in education to restore, quote, national pride. Um, and then, of course, this would invoke protests from China and Korea, especially. And um, Koizumi would, you know, but then he'd, he'd try to pander to his base to say, to try to stand up to China and Korea and say, you know, look how strong we are, look how strong Japan is, Japan is number one, etc. Um, when in fact, um, he's really just trying to kind of um, incite people, essentially, <clears throat> to incite his base and to garner support when, and, and to just take attention, to shift attention away from the fact that he's really cutting people's wages and social security. Um, and also the fact that Japan, and especially the LDP, remains uh, totally subordinate to the U.S., even to the point where um, Koizumi and other members of the LDP would try to pitch the import of more U.S. beef as somehow being, quote, pro-Japanese. Um, and the opposition itself continued to be sidelined so that there was just a, in the words of Gavin McCormick, simulacrum of a two-party system which really amounts to a confrontation between two wings of a single conservative party. And this relates to this factionalism within the LDP, as we've talked about in previous lectures. And, quote, consensus prevails on the priority of U.S. demands, this should be capital U.S., uh, demands for security, cooperation, and on neoliberal social and economic policies. So again, not much of a difference on these things between the LDP and the DBJ. Okay, this is, brings us to the conclusion then. Uh, so just to wrap up and to reflect back on what I've uh, talked about, neoliberalism uh, is a phenomenon in global capitalism whereby the old embedded liberalism, such as social welfare, rising wages, Keynesianism, etc., was replaced with forced privatization, the gutting of social welfare, falling wages, increased precarity, and austerity. In Japan, neoliberal scholars and politicians enacted neoliberal policies from the 1980s, such as the privatization of state industries, smashing social welfare, breaking the power of labor, etc. Koizumi carried on these traditions through the privatization of the Postal Service. But these things failed to reduce the fiscal deficit. And this is very important. The fiscal deficit in Japan continues to grow uh, uh, exponentially as in regards to production and the G uh, uh, relative to production and the GDP. But again, that doesn't really matter because neoliberalism wasn't really about reducing the fiscal deficit in the first place. Its real aim was the upward transfer of wealth. So the results of this naturally have been growing inequality, depoliticization, 
uh, which in this case refers to the uh, low voting rates and just general disinterest uh, in voting and politics on behalf of or uh, amidst the local uh, amidst the um, general public. Uh, on the one hand, versus increased financialization and micromanaged surveillance state on the other. Uh, and by this, I mean, for instance, uh, things such as the My Number System, the State Secrets Law, uh, but more on this in future lectures. And neoliberalism and neo-nationalism, or neoconservatism, uh, Nihon Jinron, etc., uh, have been two peas in a pod, as they are in the United States, especially, uh, as well with um, uh, the tie-up between right-wing fundamentalist uh, evangelicals and the Republican Party. Uh, average citizens are made less economically secure, uh, but they're discouraged from participating in politics and urged to leave things to the, quote, experts. So civic discontent and frustration is instead funneled into nationalism. Neoliberal politicians then try to harness this nationalism into political support, for instance, Koizumi and others' visits to the Yasukuni Shrine, etc. And we'll talk more about this in a later lecture. That brings me to the end of my talk, uh, quite a long talk, and I'm sorry if I kind of uh, rushed through this at a very fast pace, just a lot of uh, words on a blank slide, essentially, that I'm reading from, but I've tried to sum I'm trying to summarize um, a fair amount of, of prior research on this subject uh, and to, make, uh, to present it in an understandable way. And so I hope uh, that in that regard, I have been uh, at least partly successful today and that um, this lecture has been enlightening on the topic of neoliberalism, but especially neoliberalism in Japan and how that has functioned and how it brings us to the point that we're at uh, today. Okay, so in later lectures, I'll talk about um, some different topics um, relating to politics and society, politics of war memory, for instance. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind today's lecture or just to have it in the back of our minds because this is still, neoliberalism is still the major hegemonic paradigm of global politics and the global economy. Uh, we have yet to overcome this. Um, and so I, I think that's important to remember uh, as we move forward. So thank you very much uh, for listening.